You're listening to the A Trip to the Moon podcast. You might be watching as well because this obviously is available on YouTube too. Uh, my name's Matt Jones. With me this evening, Rich Davis, one of our regulars on the show and a face and a voice that you will all recognise uh, in Tranmere owner uh, Mark Palios. Good evening to both of you, Mark. Great to have you on. Thank you very much for your time. Um, Good evening, Matt. Rich as well. Brilliant to have you on. Rich, but first of all, just kind of explain uh, your involvement in this and, and why you're here, really. Nobody wants to hear from me for very long, so I'll keep it very sweet. Um, I suppose what I would say is um, this is probably one of the brilliant things about social media and, and one of the, the good sides of social media. Um, I think Mark has quite often talked about the anti side of social media, but over the last uh, couple of months, um, Mr. Chairman has been kind enough to listen to uh, some of my positivity and uh, and some of my uh, anecdotes that I've uh, picked upon uh, some of our performances and situation we've been into. And uh, after approaching Mark and asking him, would he consider coming on and having a chat? There's plenty of things as fans, I think, that we all want to um, see change on the pitch at Tramia. And there's plenty of things that, there's, that people want questions answered. And to get someone like Mark to, and, and the beauty of you know the football club we've got, the transparency that Mark's willing to come on here and have a little chat with us, I'm, I'm delighted. Um, and uh, even just off camera when we were just setting up the interview there, I've got no doubt that what Mark has to say to Tramia fans is going to be very, very interesting to quite a few people. So uh, for everyone who called me a happy clapper, um, I had the last laugh because uh, uh, this gent has, uh, has come to the table uh, to answer a few questions and uh, spend a bit of time talking to us. So um, thank you for coming on and doing this, Mark. I uh, totally appreciate it. And, uh, and likewise, Matt does it ourselves. It's, uh, it's quite a big thing to uh, you know, stand out and especially when form hasn't been great at this moment in time to stand in front of us fans and on a fan podcast where the reality of it is there's, there's probably been conversations on this podcast that maybe have led to, to negativity because there's some speakers we have that aren't all necessarily as positive as myself about the football club um and and, and this is i suppose one of the good things about social media is uh, everyone gets to have their voice and and everyone gets to be heard so thank you for coming on and you know uh, yeah yeah matt brilliant once again the podcast uh, for your efforts keeping it going Absolutely. Well, let's let's dive straight into things then, Mark. Um, oh, can I just, say, can I, thanks for that, Richard. And uh, it, it, there's a couple of things that came out there, which hopefully will will um, which will be a theme later on that we can pick up on. One is positivity, because at the end of the day, in the position that we're in, that's what we need uh, from everybody. And I think if you saw Nigel's um, post-match interview the other night, I think that was it was spot on in terms of what what is needed at this point in time. We should stick in together working hard, et cetera. And I can talk a little bit about the dressing room in terms of the dressing rooms that I've been in, because I spent 17 years with professional clubs. So I'll pick up on that aspect. Uh, the other thing, as you mentioned, quite ironically, is, is being called a happy clapper, which always which always amazes me because, you know, I, I tend to see um, a lot of the criticism that comes up and through uh, actually from happy clappers. And by that, I mean, ironically, they're the people who are happy clapping when we're doing well. But actually, the people you want around you are the people who will also be positive when you're not doing so well. And that's been a real supporter of the club, as it were. So, uh, as I say, when people call you a happy clapper, um, maybe you want to turn it back on them. But, but, but you know, thank you for that. Absolutely. Well, let's just, you touched on a few things there, Mark. Let's get your assessment of where things are with Tramway at the moment and how you kind of feel generally the season has gone or, or why it's gone in the direction it's gone. Well, there's a lot of questions in that. The first thing is how I feel. Uh, I mean, I, what people seem to miss out is I'm a fan as well. And, uh, you know, it, it, for me, it's 24-7. So, you know, I, I can't go to work and, and, and forget about it to any extent. Uh, I actually take it home with me and uh, I take it home with Nikki and the family and, and everybody else. So it's always been a family thing here since, since uh, we came back to the club. And it's all pervasive. So, you know, are we happy with where we are at this point? So, no, we're not. And people know they can't speak to me within 45 minutes of us losing the game. You know, if we haven't, if we've played badly or whatever. So in terms of, you know, my personal uh, view, I, I'm as unhappy as, as any other fan. In terms of um, my view as chairman, ultimately, um, I'm responsible for where we are. Um, but it becomes a bit one dimensional and, and this is what a lot of fans won't quite get because it is massively important to them, the club, it is massively important to them what happens on the pitch. 
but that's only one real aspect of this club. And there's a, there's a phrase that um, I, I use a lot, which is um, from Winston Churchill. You may, people may not like him. It, it, I, I, I guess he's been cancelled or whatever the phrase is these days. But, um, you know, and, and that is what he said, you know, at the time of the war. He said, quite simply, success is never permanent. Failure is never fatal. It's having the courage to continue that counts. And, and that is it when you think about it. If you look at the people around us at this point in time, if you look at Forest Green, do you remember when they brought that team into League Two? And that team was fantastic. But they played us off the park that night. I mean, you had to applaud them. And they were seriously good winners of League Two. They went up. Where are they now? They come back down. And, you know, over 60% of clubs in the last five, 10 years that have been promoted have come back down. So what you're seeing on the pitch, massively important to you, but it is actually a temporary situation. So, you know, you, you've got to accept the ebb and flow that comes of being in the game. Does that mean I'm complacent with where we are? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, I understand that. Um, and one of the things that, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, people do know about me is I, I run my life by the poem F by Rudyard Kipling. And the first line is that, if you can keep your head when all around are losing theirs and blaming it on you, but make allowance for that blaming too. And, and that is probably the situation that we're in at this point in time. Do I think that we're going to go out of the league? I, I don't think so. I think we have a squad of players that are um, good enough to massively improve their position. Um, you hate as a professional, and, and I did when I was playing, you hate ever saying to people, oh, we're just being unlucky. Uh, but there has been an element of luck in, in this. This is one of the... Um, lowest scoring games it is the lowest scoring sport i think and as a consequence the, the margins are very small and then you start to get to a point whereby this is answering your questions why it happened there are certain other things as well that are significant but if you look at where we are i think that there's a lack of confidence at this point in time and i've said in the past when we've had a bad run i've said um, i don't mind if the performances are good because eventually it will turn except if the lack of um, points turn into a a, a a a blow to confidence and anybody who's ever i mean i played 17 years with professional clubs you know I, I'm, I'm with the ecb i was in british judo so i've known elite sports and i run the england team so i know elite sport to some extent and it's one of these things that um I, i'm not having a go at, at, at an amateur football or whatever but if you've played i mean i played in the Sunday league back in the summer when i was 16 i played in the um, I, I played in, in the Sunday leagues around the country when I finished playing pro. But I played 17 years of pro clubs. And if you're playing in a professional sport, an elite sport, you're playing against other elite players. So the competition on every game is a lot more severe than, say, you know, if I was playing for, the, uh, for, for Clifton or whatever, and we played down at Arrow Park, you knew that the avenue were always going to win at the, in those days and so forth and so on. And you knew roughly where you were. And there wasn't a crowd really making any difference to you. And so what happens in a professional atmosphere, an elite atmosphere, is, and I've seen it so many times, that somebody flicks a switch in the dressing room and the confidence is gone. And then what do you do? And equally, at some stage, somebody will flick a switch and the confidence will come back. You know, so Dorsey took over uh, after Jacko and actually won seven games on the trot. Bristol Rovers, nowhere in the league, actually shot straight the way through. So these things can happen. Now, do I think we'll... Get a run. We may not get a run of that type, but then what do you do to actually get out of it? And there's, there's two things. One is work hard and the other is stick together. And Nigel was exactly right on that when he was basically saying that. And so you have to do it, you know, because you saw Connor Jennings' interview after the game. And there's a good pro. He's, and, and, and he was hurting. He was hurting because he knows that he put a, you know, a full shift in. Again, you know, he, he's a good player uh, and he knows that he's got good players around him. But again, we didn't get a reward on the night. If you if you throw it the towel in, um, you you shouldn't be in that position. I'm going to tell you something now that nobody knows. And and this is about you know do you go the full ninety? Do you actually when the going gets tough do you disappear or do you carry on and you have a go at it and you really sort of put it all in for the club as Nigel says. And you can take it from me, everybody in the club, everybody from the lady who takes the calls about events and tickets and things like that, right the way through to Nigel, who's currently the manager of the side. Everybody is working to make this club get better and get to the position it should be in. So I'll just tell you something now that, 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 that's not been heard before.
and that is that um, when we well when we went out the league, I went down to see the fans, and they were fantastic. And this was at Plymouth. I went back to my seat. We sat down, and um, I said to Nicky, "said Nicky, we're going to be okay. We'll get out." The, during the week, I was trying to work out what I was going to say because I was going to take the media, not not Sean, who was in in, in post with Alan, as they were interims, and it wasn't fair. And and I worked out. I said, "What I'm going to?" Say. I tried to work, find a word to cover it. And we were going out of the league for the first time in our history. And I know I'm a Chalmier fan, I'm an ex Chalmier player, I'm here as, as the new chairman, and I couldn't stop the momentum of us going out of the league. And I tried to find a word to describe it, I thought disappointing. Now, disappointing isn't big enough as an adjective. And I found devastating. De and I like alliteration devastating today, but not disastrous tomorrow. So, in other words, you go again and you go again. So, that's what I said. And then on the way back, um, my phone actually ran out of battery in the car on the way back. So many people were ringing up and saying, you know, you'll be fine, you're this and that and the other and, and, and so forth. I got back. I didn't sleep that night. And I actually started, I got up at five o'clock and I started, this is a Sunday morning, and I started sending emails out to the staff um, about what we were going to do, this and that, da, 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 da. Uh, and I then got up and I started writing a five-year plan. Around about seven o'clock on the Sunday morning, after they travelled back from Plymouth, most of them, um, I started getting emails back from the staff, and I didn't expect that till Monday morning. Well, what was happening? These people were already working on getting back from having gone out the league, and something else happened. I wrote a, um, a five-year plan that morning, and I adjusted it for a month. And I always think you should have a five-year plan. You've got to have it on one piece of paper, and I had it on one piece of paper. And then two weeks later, I was diagnosed with cancer. The only, and, and, and a pretty um, virulent, aggressive form of it, and the only piece of paper I had to take the, the, the prognosis from the consultant when I sat in his office in Harley Street is my five-year plan. So I've still got that five-year plan and scribbled on the back is all the details of the options and this and that and the other, what's going to happen. Now, at that point in time, you know, we'd gone out the league for the first time in our history. We'd been there a year. Couldn't really blame us because that was what was set up. You know, the budget, the budget of the club at that time was um, our budget now is 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 um, two and a half times that. And at that time, on that budget, we were losing a million pounds a year. So I had all the all the reasons to go at that point in time. I even had the the, the get out of jail card that I had aggressive cancer. But I didn't, I stayed. And I'm not asking for plaudits from that. The point I'm trying to make is you've, when the going gets tough, you've got to get going as well. You can't just walk away from it. And that's what we've got at this point in time. We've got to all stick together and make sure that the qualities in this squad are actually coming, are going to come through and will come through on the pitch. And if they work hard, I think that they will eventually turn it. There are other things that need to be done, but actually that's the basic and we have to stick together and we have to do that. Just to, to respond to a lot of what you've said there, there has been, and I'm sure you've seen it, criticism on, on social media of people saying you don't care anymore. And that's clearly not the case. And I can see from what you're saying that that, that, that clearly hurts you quite a lot. Well, it, it's quite interesting that people say you don't care because I would never ascribe to somebody what, what their emotions are, uh, sorry, what their motives are and how they feel about things. That I don't care. No, I, I can tell you something now. If I didn't care, I'd have been gone a long time ago. Because at the end of the day, I came here and my view is I'd be here for five years. Because um, I, I come back to the point of potential in a club. I felt that we would get to the point whereby we could achieve our potential within five years. But you look what happened. We went out, out the league and we actually um, were three years in the National League. So there's four of the years gone. We got back in um, and we got investment in which was to take us further forwards and that was important because you need the capital to to expand the club and then what happens we hit covid and not only do we hit covid we have a pitch collapse so there's a million quid gone on the pitch collapse covid comes along uh, we don't have the gates we then get demoted and so you lose the, the league one monies as well with players that we were anticipating we're going to be in league one and so forth and then you come back to the cost of living crisis. So, you know, we then went through a pretty difficult time, which has extended my stay here, our stay here, until um, until where we are now. So, you know, for people to come and say, um, 
uh, I don't care anymore. They should have come in when I squared up to a, a Doncaster supporter, which I'm not proud of, but on the other night, because he burst into our boardroom and shouted, Donny, and I chased him out afterwards. And, and, and that is shouldn't be for a 71-year-old man doing that. And that's because I care. And so, you know, people can say that, but, you know, to be quite honest, I, 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 I think it's it's one of those things, Mark. Yeah, you, you, you look at, you know, look, I, I'm realistic. So it, 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 it irritates me. It doesn't bother me. There was a spell when I was pulling in some of the people on social media, when I used to look at social media. And by the way, the only reason I, I came back to you, Richard, is you're one of the few people who can DM me. Uh, from a previous life uh, and 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 so i i only deal with dms so <laughs> what there was a stage when i got the, i got the um the, the media guys to pull in a few people off social media who've been saying stuff and i'd pull them in and, and i and i'd rip them up because their opinions they're entitled to their opinions but i'm entitled to say well are your opinions evidenced by anything what's backing it up you know what if you're saying was skint what do you know about the insolvency act section one two three I wrote the insolvency business plan for the biggest insolvent business on the planet, the strategy. So I'm more than happy to debate insolvency with people and so forth. So it, but at the end of the day, it was just a waste of my time because, you know, you know, for everyone that I, I took through, you know, you've lost the dressing room. I had the first England, I had the first England player strike, <laughs> you know, played in the dressing room. They've never been near a professional dressing room, played there for 17 years. So, yeah. so it's just like, why tell me that? I and, think the and, thing and it comes down it's more about them than it is about the club and that's that's the thing that this sort of you know gets me so i don't do social media because of that because it takes energy away from what is the real job in hand and i keep saying this the fans will look at the next five games i've got to let them look at the next 2500 games the next 50 years and you know so the first five years were all done and dusted when I should have gone out, but then we got hit with COVID and so forth and so on. So I've had to stay in to once again, finish the job off and do the job properly. And, you know, your question is, where does that, where does that take us? We need to get more capital into the business. And by that, you know, you say, well, are you selling the club? It can be a sale of the club, but only if it means that it's a sale to people who are the right people and who will actually put money into the club to do the things we need to do. Now, people may disagree with what are the things we need to do, but I think we certainly need to do things like finish the campus project, which then produces cash on a yearly basis, which you can then use on the playing budget rather than just put the cash straight into the playing budget. There might be some cash that goes into the playing budget in the short term, etc. But it's about investing in the long term in the club. And, you know, the, the new stadium, that's on hold at this point in time because I've got other things to sort out uh, and so forth. So... There's still stuff to do, but it's whether we do it, Nicky and I do it, or whether somebody else does it. It doesn't really matter. It's about creating a platform for that to happen. And in the meantime, we've got to keep things going on the pitch. So that's the constant tension that you've got if, if you're dealing with it. And, you know, lots of the work that I do is around that. And I want, I want the pitch work to be something that I can forget about and get on with the stuff that, you know, I'm really sort of best placed to deal with. It's it's a it's a difficult balance to people who, um, it's a difficult communication to people. I, I can't really explain to people, uh, you know, what what needs to be done in the club in that way. But I, I think some people can see it, some people can't see it. But that's a function of their experience. And that's that's something I think we've spoke about. To be fair, um, of, of, in DMs, you've you've given up my secret now. Uh, you know how I can slide into your DMs and get response. Um, but uh, that's something we spoke about quite a bit. And uh, reality for for me and the way I kind of put social media and I put this to you, it sounds quite cheesy, um, but I'm not proud to say when we got relegated in 2015, I was one of those that was shouting it wasn't good enough how could we you know get relegated out of the football league for the first time i remember walking back to my little flat in oxton and being all puffy eyed and angry and 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 the reality of it is i think what changed with me with myself um i i, I had a uh, director for the day uh, purchase from when I did the John Aldridge thing and, I, and myself and my father sat with you and listened to this kind of chat from yourself and, and Nicky at the time telling us what was going to happen over the next few years and and talking about as you say sort of like see your five-year plan and um, for me um, I think the way I put the social media side of things and we kind of hold 
you know, Tramia fans hold our club and hold our uh, players and and someone like the chairman, like yourself, we, you're kind of held in a status, which is almost, I suppose, like there's a quite a noisy club not too far away that's got a super superhero that is an owner, quite literally from Hollywood. Um, so really, you are kind of our superheroes. So when things are going great and Mark Palios is running around Wembley with a Greek flag, you know, we can't be anything more than proud. However, um, yeah, I can totally understand when someone's travelled a good few hundred miles why they don't get upset. Uh, do get upset about the football results because that's how it's our church and that's how much we invest in the club. And you know, we it's that it's that song of till we die. You know that we we do blindly follow. Um, I think obviously from the point of view of where you were saying about you know your your exit and and, and kind of passing the baton on to the next people um, and, and and the work you've got as matt quite rightly said people call out going they see decisions on the pitch and see us being closer to a trap door and start asking the question do you care which you very eloquently answered but obviously passing the baton on is is that something that's active now is it something that's uh, uh you know if the right circumstance comes up or is it something that is is something that you, you you're currently working on with people now yeah, it, it's something to be quite honest, Richard, that um, has always been there as, as part of the um, the intention. Because I knew when the, our, our partners from Santini came in um, that we didn't have enough, I'd, I'd call it, you know, if I said capitalization in the balance sheet, I mean, gas in the tank to get from A to C, and we're A and we need to, we're going through B at this point in time. So it, it, we needed more to come in to do the things that would get us into a position where we're self-sustainable, you know, in in League One, and 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 that is um, that is still the case. So to some extent, it's always it's always been there as something that we've been looking to do. But have I gone out? Uh, has Nicky and I, have Nicky and I gone out and said, look, you know, we want to sell this business to anybody, and you know, we're, look, we're looking for a sale? No, is the answer. Have people come to us? And the answer is yes. And we talk to people continually. We, you know, we're in the position that we're in, but near the bottom of the league. But we have a load of people knocking on the door, and we've just got to make sure it's the right people that come through that door. Now, you know, most of them will say when they come in, you know, we want you to stay on. And, and I, my view is um, I, I would only stay on on the basis of um, a, a smooth handover because I'd want to protect the employees that have contributed a hell of a lot. You know, you, 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 what people miss is the, the the extent to which there's a lot of good quality staff in the club now who've given a hell of a lot to taking it to where it is. And, you know, we don't pay them a, a great fortune. And, and, and so with them, it's a question of making sure that uh, anybody who comes in actually understands the worth of these people, because if they don't, the club will take a backward step. So that's one thing in terms of whether I'd want to stay on uh, for for a period of time. Um, the 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 other side to it is the connections that I've automatically built up because of being chairman of the club. You know, so with the local politicians and everything else, which is massively important to the club, and that's something that we developed at the club over the period of the time that we've been here. A lot of which has come off the back of the community stuff that we do. But, you know, we could say, well, we're doing this on the community and people say, oh, well, you need to buy a striker for the pitch, forget the... But the community stuff's massively important because it builds up a credibility with um, the local council, with the Liverpool City region and so forth and so on that enables us to do things. You know, when I was at the FA, every club was fighting with its council. We're not. We've got a partnership with our council. Uh, and that's a consequence of a lot of the good work from a lot of the people around around the community. And also, you know, our, our fan base is great uh, in terms of you know, Nate's tickets. You look at that and the number of thousands of kids that have come to the game as a consequence of the goodwill of not only the, the, the fan base, but equally, you know, the corporates around the place. Now, all that's massively removed from what's going to happen tomorrow on the pitch. Um, but actually, it's all part and parcel of building a firm foundations, which is why the club's attractive to a lot of people you know, from outside who come in and are actually quite surprised at, at what the club now is compared to what it was. I don't expect to get plaudits from guys on the cop who may, you know, would rather boo the players or whatever, boo me. Um, but what I do expect is that the majority of fans understand that my focus, Nicky's focus, has been on a lot of um, developing this groundwork 
that makes the club an attractive club. And it, it, it's a difficult one to play because I remember I was at the FA and uh, we refinanced Wembley, re got Wembley built, uh, we changed the disciplinary system, we would um, got ourselves into Euro 2004 from a position where UEFA were trying to kick us out of Euro 2004. And the comms guy came to me and said, right, we need to do a half year statement. And um, you know, what, what do you want me to say? And I went, well, we've done this, 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 and this, and this. And he looked at me and he shook his head and he laughed. And he said, nobody's interested in that. They were interested in, in Beckham, they were interested in Sven, they were interested in Rooney and so forth. So I understand that, I understand that, but people have to understand that uh, this is, you know, to say that I've lost interest is is just, I don't, you know, I think in life, there's a problem that people judge people by their own standards. And and sometimes I think maybe, yeah, they would think if it gets tough that, you know, that's, that's you know, he's lost interest now, he's been here long enough, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is, no, finish the job. Uh, and I think that that's what, um, um, you know, you're saying to the guys there, finish the job on the pitch, get it done. You've got to finish the job. And the job isn't finished yet. Uh, but when it's finished and when somebody else can take that baton and can take the club further and better than us, you know, we'll hand the baton on. It's as simple as that because that's part and parcel of what the job is. I've said it many times, owning a football club is being in a relay race without a finishing tape. There's no finishing tape because it starts next year, it starts the year after. So, and all you've got to do is make sure that you hand the baton on with better field position than when you took it. And we are now in better field position. Not if you take the judgment, the parameters for your judgment is where we are in the, in the league at this point. Because we're certainly not. We're exactly where we are when we came in. But the reality is, I know that there are better foundations in this place. And there's a lot of people who know that who are looking at football clubs. And therefore, it's easier to sort of get somebody. To, Peter was Peter Johnson was looking to get somebody to come in for years and years and years. Couldn't get anybody to come in. And now we have people who want to come in and want to take over the club, want to put cash in. And, and, and so, you know, we will be doing something along those lines, I would hope, you know, within the next 12 months. Can I ask you about COVID? Obviously, you've touched on it there, and you've, you've kind of outlined how big a, a blow it was to, to the football club in, in what happened to the club. I mean, financially, how much did it damage Tramia? How far did it set you back? Because you'd have had those players on wages in League One money that you then had didn't have the League One money coming in when you expected it to, and you were a League Two club, so had the League Two money. So it must have been a huge, huge financial hole for you. Yeah, I mean, you can look at it and say there was about three three point seven million just being in the national league of losses that we had to take to get out of the national league, uh, and then on top of that, you got a million pounds sort of pitch collapse, and on top of that, I, I haven't actually got a figure for COVID. You'd be surprised to see because it it stretches across. There's other things like there were COVID. We, we didn't. We, we what we didn't do was take on, on on a lot of debt as a consequence of COVID. And we managed through. And you, but what you saw is um, we had to pay out those players who were under contract for, in full, who were League One players, etc. We didn't have any matches, etc. At the time, there was some handouts from the league which didn't cover it. Uh, and then we then we were signing players that summer. And what was quite interesting is we were signing players that summer. We didn't know whether we were going to be able to play or not, and we. Uh, therefore signed a lot of players on one-year contracts because we didn't want to sign on two-year contracts, uh, etc. But at the same time, there was the, they tried to put in a wage cap, which was right, and, and I was all for that. But certain clubs, the ones you probably know, tried to beat the wage cap and so immediately pumped up the wages of players that you were trying to sign. So we, we then had massive, a, a, a bubble of inflation prior to that. And, and we, anyway, we got through that. We got through COVID and so forth and so on. But the reality is that um, I need to go back and recapitalize the thing to take it forward so we can do the campus project. We can do the things that we want to do that will make the club into, you know, uh, 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 throwing off more cash for the playing budget year in, year out. And, and, and you know, we're on our way to, to doing that. Hopefully, obviously, then those things... Um 
can materialise and, and we'll see what, what happens going forward. I just wanted to ask you one question that a lot of people are talking about in terms of the managerial position. And I know you don't want to speak about specific individuals, but Nigel's uh, title is interim manager. Is there a, a search ongoing or is Nigel the person that, that, that is in place and will be staying in place? Um, well, well, whether Nigel stays in place or not is probably, if you don't mind, is something that Nick Nigel will, like, will either talk about. Um, put it this way, uh, if I just explain a little bit about, if if, I, if you've not heard me explain it before, about um, how I put together the structure. And people said, you know, Dorsey's a... Um, Forgive me if I've, I have said this to somebody recently. So it may, uh, Dorsey's a, a, a cheap uh, option. No, because I actually put in to cover off. To take a step back, if you want, if you want a manager in this league and you want an experienced manager, which when I first came in, I thought, yeah, you'd have you'd have an experienced manager if you could. If you want an experienced manager, you're shopping from a pool of failures. Because they've all failed. Because if he's experienced, he won't be looking for a job in League Two, etc. If he's been successful, so that's the general premise. Also, managers have, have changed over the period, even in the time I've been in here. And you're now looking at, at guys who can really sort of do the coaching. And I would argue on the basis that a lot of the managers, when I was playing, didn't coach at all. Uh, and then eventually it's come through, and you've now got a breed of managers who being co trained to coach. We've actually got a breed of managers coming in who've played on the managers who've been trained to coach, which is even better. And then they're a better coach and so forth and so on. So there is a, a new breed of, 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 of coach um, rather than manager who's come along. Dorsey is, is, is a good coach and was a good coach. Whether he could make it at manager, I wanted to put around him um, an experienced technical director so he could leverage off him. And also uh, an, an assistant manager underneath who was up and coming. He wasn't ready, but wanted to learn, etc., and so forth. So when when you get somebody in place who knows everybody within the club, knows the players, knows knows the fans, knows the club, and actually is a good coach, and you put around him the belt, the building blocks, the, the the ballast to help him. That's not a cheap option, but actually it gives you the chance to bring in a coach. Because you know, if I brought in another coach from somewhere else, how would you know how good he was, et cetera, and so forth and so on? And would you have to change other staff and the, and the players and so forth? So getting the continuity to come through is one of the things I think a club needs to do anyway. Um, but I could never say this. If, if, if you look at the manager, he's always going to leave. And he's either going to be a good lever or a bad lever. If he's a good lever, which means we've probably done well and got promoted or whatever, then you probably pull Danzi through because Danzi will have been learning, doesn't want to go because he wants to become a manager and takes the opportunity to continue it and take it through. Not quite the old boot room of, of, of Liverpool's days, but you know what I mean. You get this continuity and you get the culture and ethic in the club. So that's if he's a good lever. If he's a bad lever, which is technically what we had here, in other words, he has to go, and um, what do you do then? Well, you bring Nigel in as an ideal replacement as the interim manager. Now, I could never say that publicly because that would undermine Dorsey. But, you know, if you look at it, um, that's why that was done. Now, there's another thing in this because I've just said if you're going to go out to recruit, you um, are going to recruit from a pool of failures. But it's worse than that because you're going to go out and recruit at some point in time, which you don't choose because you've had to sack the manager. And therefore it happens to be who happens to be around at this point in time as well, on top of that as another variable you want to avoid. But if I've got a guy who is a massively respected manager in the game, who um, played in the club, it was actually a teammate of mine and, and I, I was, you know, he's, he's not that old, but <laughs> he was a teammate of mine. Um, and just one thing before everybody gets on the, on the high horses, I, I never recruit friends, but I make friends with the people I recruit. As it happens, in this case, I made an exception because he was an exceptional candidate for the job as technical director. He knows the club. He's committed to the club. And um, if he comes in as interim manager, he knows the players and so forth because he's been there as technical director. And therefore, at this point in time, it doesn't mean that I've got to rush out 
and, and get a new manager in. Because if you bring a new manager at this point in time, um, it, 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 I, I've got my, t what I'm saying is I've got the time to, to sit here, see who comes available. And uh, when they come available, take a view as to whether or not he's a better candidate. And Nigel is, is quite happy to sit where he is. It may be that at some stage, you know, the, the, the conversation is that he becomes the, the manager of the club. Um, you know, if, if I'm looking at what's required at this point in time, he's exactly what's required because you need somebody who's, is, he's obviously confident, uh, uh, Nigel, he's very positive. And that's what we touched on earlier on, I think, Richard. And that is the positivity that's required to lift a group of players at this point in time that need lifting as much as anything else. They don't need a kicking up the backside because, you know, you know, they're getting that anyway. That then they're probably beating themselves up. I come back to watching um, Connor in, in his conversation. So I, I think that you know, Nigel is, is probably the best person for the job as we sit at this point in time. I think as well. Uh, uh, I know very little of the football world, but I do know the world of recruiting. And in particular, obviously, if technically the Tramier job, the Tramier manager's job has been open in the last six months twice, is it a case of you get the same old, in my case, I get emails of CVs of used car salesmen, which to be fair, could have similar sorts of credentials as uh, some of the lower league managers, as you just said, with rather checkered pasts. Um, uh, obviously, on social media, we see the same names linked with the club. Is it the case that you tend to get the same kind of agents and the same kind of names uh, express an interest in coming to the club? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about the club is 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 that it, it's not a club that uh, you need to advertise uh, in terms of go out and, and put an advert in the paper to say, please come and... Because uh, people actually want to be at the club. I think it's got a good reputation. Um, and uh, yeah, everybody who's who's out of a job would probably have a look at the club and say, well, yes, yes, maybe. And and I think it's for us to to choose from that. Um, and I, you know, it, so we, we constantly sort of look in. We know who's around and who's not around, etc. And, and um, just as we look at the players, you know, we do our due diligence on these people as well. So really interesting, and I know that. Uh, a lot of people will be fascinated by that answer and also it will maybe give them some information that they've been craving as to what the, the future of that post looks like as well. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, obviously, you've said you're confident the club is going to stay up. You believe that they've got what it takes and that a run is is just around the corner. We've seen it before. How important sorry, could sorry, January can I, can be? I, can, I, can I just stop you on that? I believe a run is just around the corner. I'll be, <laughs> and I'll be the cautious accountant and I'll say... You know, do you know the way you you way you come out of these things? Sometimes you you, you get a scrappy nil nil or whatever, and then you might get a a one nil uh, and, and a win at one nil, and you and you you graft and you scrape and you get and you gradually build some points and some confidence and you get, and then it, possibly you can get a run as well. But you know, it's it's not going to be we're not going to get a dozy you know, seven wins on the trot, and we play a team tomorrow. You know, they've won nine on the trot. Well, you know, it, it's a difficult match tomorrow, but. You know, the guys have got to turn up. You know, they're a good side, but you've got to turn up. And uh, you know, they, I think they will turn up, and I think they'll, you know, put the effort in. And uh, the point I'm making is, there is nobody out there as manager who's going to come in and make a real fist of it. He's going to come in. He's going to have a look at the staff. He's going to go through certain players and and have a, another look at them. Nice is quite is quite. Um, I think he's he's got his views now on all the players because he saw them before as a technical director. Um, so I'm back. I'm back to that theme again. I was just trying to stop you saying, I, you know, because people will hang me and say, "Well, where's the run you promised us?" I, I don't <laughs> promise you a run. I'm saying that there is a chance you could have one. Somebody will flick that switch in the dressing room, and it will go the other way. Somebody soundbiting you, Mark. Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen those run, uh, those moments happen. I mean, I vividly remember the 2017-18 season when there was a 1-0 win, uh, I think, against uh, Barrow, which really kick-started things. And hopefully uh, something similar can, can be just around the corner. But how important, because we've seen it before with, with you and the way you plan for seasons, how important is January going to be? January is always important. And, uh, you know, and again, um, and I went in on a meeting today and, and they were looking at uh, targets for January. And I say so I went in, I was passing through and there was a meeting. They were already doing that. 
um, spending the money in January. But, uh, it was nice to know. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I mean, January, January is massively important. I think one of the things that's different as to where we are as a club compared to where we were when we came in in that first season. We came in in that first season and, you know, I, I don't talk about individual players, but we had a pretty poor squad. And I knew that when I came in, we came in, in, in on August the 9th and I knew we had a pretty poor squad and we were bottom of the league in January. And, and you were trying to bring in players there and players just didn't want to come you know, because it, it, it is what it is. You know, you, you're down at that end of the league, etc. Uh, do I think we'll be down to that? We might be around that, but we're in a totally different position. People know you only have to come to the training ground now. So instead of going to Sprague's Farm or wherever it was that we had the the two port, not the porter cabins, the old shed, and and I think one pitch which was, which was based on clay, you come to a fantastic training ground. You know the two lads who came from Sheffield were saying, "Wow, this is fantastic." And interestingly, they said, you know, I don't know why we are where we are, because they said the quality of the players that we've actually got. And they said that to their agents who repeated that to me. So you, you talk about, obviously, uh, January recruitment. And it's something that, once again, I'm not talking about specifics of players and, and, and ourselves. But I suppose in this division now, there are quite a few uh, rather noisy, quite um, cash rich kind of clubs that are either think they're passing through or, or watch. You know, we've spoken in the past, and and you you were always aiming about and and something that you may have been sound bitten on um, about being a top quartile budget and uh, towards the top of the league in budgets. Where we are now, where do you feel? Get a feel for where we are. Do you, do you feel that we're this money that you're spending and the hard earned cash that Premier tr- fans are spending on games and, and and you by the looks of it doing a share release of I've put money into the club as well. Do you feel that you're fighting at the top end of a table with budget wise, or are we mid middle of the pack? You know, where do you think we are? I, I think we're in fair, in fairness, I think we're probably middle of the pack at this stage, uh, and I, and I think that um, you know it, it, what you're what you're searching for is is, is my phrase, and it, it was again you can look at a line in the poem if. Uh, which is, if you can bear to hear your words twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. What I actually said at the time is nobody's defined what a self-sustainable club is, but I'll do that for you. You have a top third budget in whatever league you play in and you break even. So um, one is, you know, are we breaking even? No. Um, and are we in the top third in this in this particular league in this year? I, I would doubt it this year. But are we, you know, mid-table? Are we higher than where we are in the table? Yes, we are. And the answer is that I was always saying that that you should, you would strive to get there to break even. And one thing that's happened certainly over the course of the the nine years is you know, that's got harder and harder as the gaps have got bigger and bigger. And um, you know, we we that's why it's even more important that if we are to compete. If we are to compete in the uh, in the future, we need to build assets like the campus that will throw off money that year in and year out, year in and year out, will go into the playing budget, irrespective of what happens on the pitch. In terms of, we don't have to be doing well on the pitch to make the money, and we also need to get into a position of developing players uh, and and getting that as an income stream. That's another. Uh, prospect that, that, that we're, we're trying to move on to and change in terms of the recruitment. You know, we turned down half a million quid in in January for players because uh, we wanted to keep them because we couldn't make the squad any better if we'd spent the money elsewhere. But that's dismissed by people. And you know, we, we've sold players since. And you know, people saying, "Where's the what's in their Bristow money?" And this, oh well, you know. Um, I haven't got the time, with all due respect, to go and explain to them you know, the ins and outs of the finances of the football club because it's actually quite complex, and, it, and um, you know, I'm not sure that they, they quite get it in terms of where it is. It's all in the budget, and as I, as I said, um, you know, we're fairly transparent, and people can see our accounts. We don't hide anything, um, and and if anybody wants to to hear it from the horse's mouth, we've we've never taken a penny out of the business. We put five million in, so oh, you know, a significant uh, amount of money. It really is. I mean, I'm sure there's people who are listening Sorry, to this. Six, if you count, six if you count equity, and there's other stuff around that that we've done, and um, we haven't taken a penny out. Can I just say something else? You know, people dismiss the fact that and say I don't care. 
you know, my family cares as well. And my family have been involved in this. And there's one thing that interested me. Uh, I saw at one stage, um, you know, my daughter's worked in, in the business uh, for a bit. And the people said, oh, it's, it's nepotism. Well, you know, as an, I needed an accountant. And my daughter, who's first time, got a first class degree and four, four times pro, national prize winner in the exams, in some of the toughest professional exams you'll get in the country. Now, I couldn't recruit that, even if I paid the money. They wouldn't come to Tramway Rovers Football Club. And she came on a pittance here and helped to do what we did. My other daughter's got a you know a first class degree and also a, a master's from in international business. She's built the international business for us. You know, so it, this wasn't about nepotism. This was about getting quality people in. And Nicky, Nicky's an Oxford graduate, uh, you know, and being a top lawyer in in her, in her day. And she works you know, day to day in the club with me on loads of projects. And you know, I just want to say to people that they dismiss all of that. They, you know, they think we don't care, etc. And this is all I'm trying to say to people. This is this is um, you know, twenty four seven for us. Despite what people think, it's twenty four seven, and uh, we we will get it right, and we and we will move it on. Yeah, okay, it's temporary. It is where it, we are where we are in the league. Am I complacent? Absolutely not. I do. Am I? Am I furious at the end of a game? Yeah. Am I bemused by the fact that with the quality that we've got, you know, we're sitting where we are at the bottom of the league? Yeah, I am. But what I do know is that hard work, keeping together, will get us out of it. And that's the message that has to come across to everybody because everybody in the club is doing that at this point in time. The fans need to do it as well. I think everyone on uh, on social media is looking for a uh, a silver bullet to kind of fix the situation yeah. at the league position. Um, I suppose... I'm not one, going to send it through to me. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't start asking for bullets through the post, Mark. I think you know. I have death threats at the FA, so I'm very <laughs> used to it. <laughs> uh, I think, and that's it. I think uh, for me, like so, uh, as I said, we, we talked about the terminology of uh, of happy clapper and positivity, and uh, that the listening to Nigel's interviews, I think one of the messages I sent to you was even after um, it was. Uh, I really liked his uh, match feedback after the. Um, uh, the, the, the the defeat the other week, and it was it was it was nail on the head stuff. He kind of talked like a fan, and ultimately he's confirmed it in the pre match this week. He is a fan. Ultimately, you and Nigel are both fans. The one thing I was going to say that you know, obviously, if you've got a message out there, you know, if any of the players were in particular to listen to this and they were to get something through, what would you say, you know, to to that playing squad that are pulling on your club's crest tomorrow uh, in in a very tricky game at Stockport? You know, what would be your message? Uh, what would be your message to to to, to them? The, the message that we we give to the players when they come in, and one of the things we try and do, is to is to tell them and define a tramway player. What is a tramway player? And I think we all know what a tramway player is. And you know, it's, and we, part of the stats that we've got is about um, we look at players who will play when they are one nil down or two nil down. So you can get the stats and we, um, and we can see whether they impact the game in the periods that their team is down and whether it's home or whether it's away. And, you know, we like to believe that all the lads that we've got have got that. And as I say, you know, it's a simple message. You've got to come in. And, and Nige, Nige said to me, uh, the lads, came, he was pleased on Monday, the lads came in after what had happened at the weekend. Uh, they were all there. They were all down. They were all... Um, looking at the things that they can do better uh, as they do on any day if they'd won they'd still do the same things and getting out working hard and then they come and and, and Morecambe and, and they put in a performance at Morecambe which again we didn't get what we deserved there but actually the reality was they didn't just cave in and it's the same message you just there are two messages work hard and actually um stick together and i think what was really good uh was that the fans at the end of the Morecambe game, um, they get, they give the lads a massive lift, and you know because they stayed and they they clapped the lads, and uh, and I know that that was there and present, uh, you know, today in the in the training ground because you know I spoke to some of the lads about it, and that was massive in terms of um, of uh, uh, massive in terms of what I was saying before that the fans are needed there. 
there's a question in my mind at times, you know, do the fans need the players to get them to go to, to give them a lift or do they, or should they lift the players? You know, because what happens at Prenton Park, they, they, they get up for it in the first five or 10 minutes and then it, it, we haven't scored it, so it tails down a bit. And it, it's important that they, you know, get there and lift it. And that, that's why I had brought the drum, which probably irritates everybody. I introduced the drum when I first came, but because it, it, it sort of, it does get that the, the crowd going. I'll just take one thing on this. What I want to say is, I mean, I've stood at Wembley and in, and in stadiums around the world uh, to hear the national anthem played. And I'm there proud as punch with me blazer on as the chief executive of the FA. You know, some great moments in there. He played France in the European Championships and stuff like that. But I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, the game in my entire football life, that you'll know what it is, that really is the most, the, the most fantastic game ever. Um, and still, you know, gives me a, an emotional thrill when I think about it, was the Ball and Wood final. Incredible. And there was a point in it that was really... Do you remember when the crowd suddenly started? 62nd minute. Yeah. And that was what won the game. It was incredible. And the more you can get of that, it's just thing again that you know if you can if you can get that spirit and oneness together, th 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 there's so much more you can do. You know, the whole it, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You know, it, it is one of those things, and and that to me, um, as I say, that's my best memory in football. I'll I'll, uh, I'll second you there because it's absolutely uh, the mine as well. What a, a day that was, and that seems like a, a perfect place to to leave things and and. I'm sure there's people screaming at me for things that I haven't asked, but you've covered so much ground, Mark, that we haven't heard before. So thank you very much for giving up so much of your time on a Friday evening to, to speak to us. And fingers crossed, uh, it starts tomorrow at Stockport that things uh, start looking on that upward trend in, ten, in terms of what's going on on the field. Yeah, no, as long as the lads put in 90 minutes effort or 100 minutes as it is now, um, you can't ask for more. And, and, you know, and then you move on to the next game and you, and you constantly go. Um, I, I would hope that uh, you know we we, we get um, our key sign in Norris back soon, which would make a difference because he's, he's he's a bit of a beast and gives us a, a focal point up there. Um, he won't play tomorrow, but you know it's it's one of those things that you know we've not really talked about, but we've missed um, in terms of what was planned at the start of the season. Um, you know, but it's 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 one of those things. If everybody sticks together, if everybody you know stands up and gets counted. Then I, you know, I think we'll certainly be sort of we're going to be safe. I know that. The question is that you know, um, how do we actually look at the next fifty years? <laughs>